The moment I do. Okay. Welcome to CSC 220, Introduction to Cybersecurity. Today is Friday, the 29th of September. What we're going to do today, it's a hands-on uh, workshop. And for those of you who have submitted your solutions, I'll be scoring those this afternoon and getting comments out for things you can do to uh, reduce the exposure in your home network environments. Now, after you take up the recommendations, one of the common recommendations I'm going to suggest is that you uh, provision or implement your own DNS, your own domain name system service in your home network. If I look at my network right now, and I do, can everybody see my screen? Yeah. And I look at my results, the campus has a range of DNS servers, but in your home network, it's likely that it just points to your gateway. What you'll likely see is 192.168.1.1 or 192.168.0.1. Put another way, your DNS server is basically passed off to the internet service provider and internet service provider uh, DNS is a common source of availability challenges. When the DNS that your internet service provider is using flops or it's compromised, uh, your network exposure increases dramatically or you just can't browse, right? So what we're going to do is show you how quick and easy it is for you to run your own virtual machine in your own home, but then we'll also talk about the three Raspberry Pis I just gave away to students an hour ago, so they could bring Raspberry Pis home and run their own DNS in their own home environment. Because I have a dozen here just waiting for a good home. And you can do this and set up your own DNS. That's going to mean that you have independent capacity to browse the internet and you have local control over what's happening. You also get to see in the cache what people are doing. So what I'd like to do is show you how that works. I'm gonna stand up a DNS server, then I'm gonna ask you to change your settings, then I'm gonna ask you to do some provocative browsing, nothing naughty, nothing that's NSFW, we don't want anything obscene, but, but something playful, right? And then we're gonna go into the DNS cache so you can see how robust it is, how it provides you with additional information on your local network, but it, it doesn't really, it's not, it's not the kind of detail where uh, somebody's gonna get tattled on, right? <clears throat> and um, what we wanna do is make sure this is operational by the end of the class so that one of the things you can do when you get your score and your first, uh, your first results back is you, you can uh, implement this DNS and then run some of the tests again to see if your network exposure changes as a result. In particular, there were some students that had some really interesting results with the GRC and with the NMAP results. And we've shared some of those already, okay? For today's uh, purposes, instead of using VirtualBox to create uh, a virtual machine, I'm going to be using Hyper-V. And this is going, I'm going, when we're finished, when we're finished with this DNS machine, we're going to take the temporary IP address. I'm going to move this machine and uh, I'm going to turn it into, um, I'm going to turn it into a permanent fixture in my office where it runs 24 seven, 365 days a year on a UPS with a generator backup in the RT park. So it may actually be more reliable than some of the DNS machines that your internet service providers are using. 
Um, I would like to get playful with it. So you see, I've started to build another machine called Papa Smurf, right? Uh, I don't think that was in our class. That was, or was it? Anybody remember something about Papa Smurf or was that in the other class? I don't recall, no. That would be pretty obvious if we had talked about Papa Smurf in here, wouldn't it? But what I'm gonna do is use that name for the DNS server out on the public network. I'm actually gonna change the name of this BHDX. So I have created, I have created in advance a virtual hard disk so that I can build this machine very quickly. Um, I'm gonna use this name for the virtual hard disk that I've built in Hyper-V. Uh, it says it's open, so let's close this here. Cancel. Uh, where else is this thing open? <clears throat> oh, I was messing with it and tried to open it. That's what I did. Uh, I use a dash C because I want my machine to know. Oh, come on now. Close the file. I don't know where it's open. Uh, give me one second here. You know what? Screw this. Uh, instead of using the Hyper-V in Windows, which is right here, I am going to use VirtualBox. So you can do the same thing in your own home environment if you'd like to. Um, and I already have Papa Smurf built. So here's what I need. Can everybody see the screen? <clears throat> yeah, we can see. I need a volunteer. This is my cell phone number. And I'm gonna build this machine and I'm gonna do it properly, but I need a volunteer to donate your data center license for this purpose so that I can use that in the office. Now, uh, let's, let's shift the gear here. Let's go to this window, Azure for Education. I need all of you to go into Azure for Education. And uh, I need you to log in. And each of you are granted a free license of Server 2022 and Server 2019, Standard Edition and Data Center Edition. If you go to the software option, what I want you to do is to scroll down and find where it talks about server. Now, each of these has a unique activation key or license key that is specific to you as a student at UVI. The data center edition, the data center edition, right, is designed for very large machines. And I'm going to take, uh, well, most students will never use that. You could use the standard edition for a virtual machine that you run in your own home. But I would ask if you know that you don't have a data center. Uh, server in your house. I mean, if you have like a machine that would go in a data center and it's got a, a terabyte of RAM and it has 25 uh, petabytes of disk space and it has four sockets with 24 cores each hyper threaded 48. So you have like 96 cores running on that machine. 
unless you have that kind of machine, you're really not going to take advantage of the data center version. What I'd like each of you to do on your own screen is to go to the data center option for 2022, please, at this time. And what I'd like you to do, I can't do it on my screen because as soon as I do it, my identity is keyed to my data center license. And the moment I click view key, I'm gonna show you and I'm recording and then I'm gonna put it on YouTube. So I'll be showing anybody else that watches the YouTube what my license key for my 2022 data center license is. And I don't want that to be a runaway freight train where Microsoft calls me in the middle of the night and they say, why are you violating our software license? Because guys in Pakistan are using this for a data center. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah, maybe having a proper license, not violating, not violating intellectual property. You know, the Millennium, uh, the, the Millennium Copyright Act and so on. What I'd like you to do on your screen is to click view key. And then if you would, if you're willing to, you can text it to me. You can text that string of characters to me at this cell phone number. And the first person I receive it from will receive additional credit. And then we will have an agreement that the machine we're running for community use with DNS is your system. You don't lose it. It's just you're volunteering it as community property. It's going to continue to run forever and ever. Uh, and all manner of people will be able to benefit from your personal DNS machine. We'll also add a website to it. So if people want to noodle around with like, you know, uh, different web pages and such, you know, you could uh, use it as a platform to share web pages, which is pretty cool. But what I'd like to do is ask you to consider sending your activation key. And uh, I want to use it to, to install the system. And we have a winner. We already have a student who has already sent the key. Thank you so much. OK, well, um, so what I'm going to do is stop sharing during the build when I enter the key because I don't want to reveal the key in the recording. But I'm going to go ahead with the build so that we can stand up this DNS server. So uh, I appreciate the student who has just sent that key. And what we're going to do is move on now. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and build the machine. And I'll do it with VirtualBox. And we'll move it into an office machine and run it in virtual box. So I have downloaded the install media for, from that same website. It's useful for data center and for, it's this download right here. That's not the key. It's just a really long, long thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that VHD to build it. So here we go. I'll create a new machine. I'm going to call this Papa Smurf. All one word. And um, I'm going to use the ISO image that I have in my temp folder, not my downloads, because that's part of my user profile. I'm using the latest one that was updated in July of 2023. That's really important. As soon as it sees this, it knows I'm dealing with 2022 standard, but I'm gonna use data center because I know I'm gonna skip the unattended install because I wanna be able to do stuff in, you know, but I did, I did choose data center before I clicked that button so I could make that selection says you have selected to skip unattended, so I don't want it to go ahead and run away without me. I, I'm going to click next. I'll select, let's see, how many gigs do I have here? The machine I have elsewhere has, 
got 16 gigs of RAM. The host I'm going to put it on in my office has 16. I'll run with eight. I'll put 8192. Is everybody with me? And I better put 6172 for now. Um, I'll use two CPUs. I have up to 16 on this machine. I'll see if I can enable EFI just because uh, 2022 server is more robust and secure. And the EFI BIOS option is going to make it more bulletproof when it's operating. I'll click next. I'm going to use an existing hard drive. And I'm going to see if there it is, Papa Smurf, right? I used the media tool to connect it to this machine. So I'm going to go ahead and choose this. And now I'm going to say next and finish. And the first thing I'm going to try to do with this build is to check the settings. Now, it's understood that before I did any of this, I checked before I build this machine, I want to make sure my host has updates. So I go to settings. My virtual box has the latest version. There are no updates because I don't want that to be hitting while I'm building this machine. It's just bad karma. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. I'd also like to be able to enable 3D acceleration because I'd like to have better graphics when I'm in there. And for storage, I want to make sure that this media is showing <clears throat> inside here and it shows it in my DVD disc. It's showing my ISO. My network, I'm going to attempt to put bridged adapter because I want this thing to pick up a local address, a local network address once we're done. Okay, so I'm going to hit OK. I'm going to hit detachable start as if I were doing this on a laptop. And away we go. Now, if we're fortunate here, what we'll have is another screen that shows our install options. There it is. Press any key. I'm going to press the key. And now we're loading the ISO from the Microsoft Azure Education website. Can everybody see the screen here? Yeah, we can see. I'm glad it's not blacked out. So I've named this virtual box creation Papa Smurf, but I have a question for you. If I want that to be the identity of the system once it's built out on the internet, have I just accomplished that in, in the windows we just walked through? Or will I have to make other changes once the machine is running? I'd assume you'd have to make other changes. Yeah, we'd have to make other changes because the setup media is going to give it a random name. VirtualBox wants to know, OK, where are the files I'm using to build this virtual machine? Now, here's the product key. I'm going to stop sharing, right? And I'm going to go ahead and fill in the product key that was provided by the student. I'm going to do this offline, but I'll have the sharing in just a moment, right? I'm going to pause the recording as well, because I don't want it to show up on the recorded windows either. So because the student gave me the data center key, the media automatically, if I had said I don't have a key, it would show standard editions and data center editions. I want the one with the GUI so I can use the GUI to configure this thing. If I were security minded and I wanted it to be bulletproof, I could use commands and use the data center plain version, which is also called core edition. It has no GUI. There is no desktop. You have to know command line. You have to know the command prompt and PowerShell commands exclusively in order to be able to configure this thing. I don't want to go through that process in class and issue command after command after command. So I'm basically going to select the desktop experience, scroll down, click the box, hit next. I'm going to go to custom. I'm using the unallocated space. I've, I've included an extra gigabyte of drive space because it's going to create a recovery partition and a safety or security partition that it does not label with a drive letter. It's going to take up some additional drive space and I want at least 
46, maybe 45 uh, gigabytes left for the server. One good thing about virtual machines is that they take less resources than an actual physical server. So I can almost double or I can cut in half the physical requirements to operate a virtual server compared to an actual physical server. If I wanted to have a dedicated physical server, I might want 120 gigabytes of uh, redundant uh, hard disk space and um, 16 gigs of RAM and at least uh, four cores of processor, physical cores of processor. In the virtual context, I can get away with two cores and eight gigs and something less than 80 gigs for the, for the, for the virtual. Um, does everybody, does everybody understand what I'm saying about the efficiency of virtual systems as opposed to actual physical systems? Now this is taking a bit. And one of the things that we want to do uh, once this machine is built is we want to add a, a role to the system. Thought this would be moving along a little faster with a pre-built virtual machine. You know, virtual hard disk. Uh, we might, it's not loading updates, is it? Let's just look and see if it's loading updates. Hmm. So yesterday, in the middle of the day, my Android phone popped up a screen window that said, hey, there's an urgent security update. You want, to, you want to apply it later or do you want to apply it now? Um, given that this is a cybersecurity class, what do you think I chose? I didn't, I didn't wait, yeah, didn't wait. So one of the things that you have to do before you install a role is to make sure that the server has a name and it has a specific uh, statically assigned IP address. You don't want a server to be using a randomly assigned address. And in this case, we're gonna break the rules a little bit. We'll go ahead and install the DNS role as soon as this is finished installing and it reboots. And then, uh, then we'll go ahead and move it onto a permanent IP address, but we'll still be able to test it for function uh, before the class is over. Are there any questions so far about how we started our install? No. Have any of you built a virtual machine with your own laptop or PC? Yeah. Okay. So an antivirus update, we're not too worried about that. I, I think while we are waiting for this to finish uh, install, what, what we're gonna do is uh, finish our review of chapter three, the NIST and ISO standards. 
Okay, so we're going to leave this running in the background, and let's just let's just make efficient use of time. Any questions? We'll check back on this in a minute. We'll still be able to do the final changes pretty quickly once it's built. Um, So what three letter acronym has to do and, and number has to do with international standards for cybersecurity? Does anybody remember from our Wednesday class? ISO 27,000. ISO 27,000, that's correct. And what are the special publication numbers that the US federal government standards uh, are, are published by NIST, does anybody remember the magic numbers? 800. It's 800, that's correct. If you see SP 800, that's federal. <clears throat> All righty. Let's see where we are with this, 48%. Can everyone see the screen? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's not too legible, is it? That says obtain management support at the very top. It says identify requirements. That's kind of fuzzy. I'm going to see if I can find a better graphic image of this, and we'll put it in the addendum. But basically, the 27,001, when, when you are standing up an information security program, these are the process, this is the process that you work through to implement a cybersecurity program. These are the steps and these are the deliverables, the things that have to be done or demonstrated, right? It's actually a very handy, a handy standard. So <clears throat> now the 2000, 27,002 volume gets into related areas about the policies, the organization and within uh, a company or a nonprofit organization or a government agency, human resource security. So, so these are supplemental things that you need to consider for, so, so when you're, you're working through the process, you need other resources for the other components of the program you need to implement. So the 2000, 27,001 tells you it's a roadmap, a process to follow, and 27,002 gives you the components to implement, right? Access control, cryptography, operation security. Another word for this is OPSEC. It has to do with loose lips sync ships, everyone. Loose lips sync ships. OPSEC. Somebody calls you up and they say, hey, um, <clears throat> I'm uh, with Microsoft support and I need you to do something on your screen. Can you read this information to me? And if you don't know, if your users don't know, uh, we don't take calls like that. that. That's operational security, right? So the NIST documents, right? Follow in a similar manner. Um, it's not as uh, straightforward and uh, structured as the ISO model. Introduction to information security. 18 is the guide for developing the security plans. That's the blueprint part, right? 
the risk assessments, that's risk management. So you're, you're trying to figure out where your risk is. How do you manage those risks? That's 37. Uh, it's the information security risk. That's a, a system view. So you're looking at the networks and the servers. 53 is my favorite. It has to do with the controls. It's not shown here. This is one thing I don't like about this slide. What you should see is 800-53. It has to do with controls and measures, right? So building an IT security awareness and training program, performance measurement guide to information security, the handbook. But 53 by far is one of the most important documents, one of the most important special publications. And uh, I may modify this slide just to make sure it's uh, included because it, it should be in there. 53 has to do with the actual controls that you use to reduce exposure. Remember, 53. Okay, and this is just a, a walkthrough of each of those, right? So it, it explains more about each of those um, standards, right? <clears throat> Your author talks about spheres of security. And this is just a useful way if you want to uh, provide diagrams for how your plan or blueprint is organized, right? And some can be very elaborate, there's more detail, others can be very basic, right? But I want you to understand the further you go out toward the public network, the complexity increases dramatically. The more internal you get for the internal environment, the plainer and simpler it is to manage. Uh, now that's a generalization, but the more exposed you are in the public network, the more layers of defense you have to have, the closer you work in inside, um, there's there's fewer concerns and components to to oversee, to manage. <clears throat> We talked about defense in depth before and security perimeter. We're going, you're going to have to draw your own version of defense in depth. I'll be sharing that with you on Monday, but this is a handy image that it's one version of a scenario where there is defense in depth because you have layers and different measures elsewhere on the network. All right, let's, um, let's take a look at where we are with the build. We're 93% done. I'm hoping we can do this in a couple more minutes here. It could be when this is finished and it wants to reboot, it cycles for a few more minutes and then we're out of time. We will finish this process on Monday in class. We will finish this process on Monday in class. We're just going to hit the pause button on the virtual machine. Um, but I'll get it to the point where there's a login. And then uh, we'll be at a place where we can turn it up and give it a try. So one thing that's curious about Windows operating system right now is that the data center version, the standard edition, and the desktop versions, Windows 11, home edition, professional edition, and server 2022, what we're told is that the operating system kernels are, are the same. It's just the extra stuff that has to do with input output that's uh, it's more enhanced and and more industrial strength for the data center version. And it, it could be that because we're using the data center version, that's why this run, is running a little slower than, uh, than before. Okay, so it's installing the features now, and then we should get a reboot uh, pretty soon. And then let's see if that reboot will give us a login quickly enough. 
can actually get this in before two o'clock. Let's see if I can close other windows for more memory. Uh, so we have AIDS. We have eight. We have our roster with us. Close this. Uh, that's restarting. We're going to restart now. We, we may get a login screen very fast. I'm going to go ahead and close more windows. Be really nice if it did. Sometimes the e, the EFI option uh, throws a lung, and we get an error message, and we can't go any further. So if that turns out to be the case, I'm seeing a screen behind here. If that turns out to be the case, uh, then I'm going to go ahead and and uh, rework the rebuild with that that. Um, that VDI file, the virtual hard disk file, and uh, we'll turn off the EFI and then uh, make sure it's ready for Monday. Does anyone have any questions? So if you have another class at two o'clock or you have other places you need to be, you can uh, peel off, enjoy the weekend. If you can stick around for just a couple more minutes, we may have a viable DNS machine you can point to and use. And that would be pretty cool. I'm going to pause the recording just so we don't have so much long in the recording. So we're back. Uh, it prompted us to provide an administrative password, and now we're in the first screen. In just a moment, you will see the server, uh, the uh, server dashboard come up. It's asking. This is a very good sign. Everybody sees this? says, do we want to allow your PC to be discoverable by this PC and other devices? We're going to answer. What do we answer all the time? All the time. No. We answer no. That's, that's correct. We don't want it to be discoverable. I'm also going to take this nuisance issue and get rid of that. Right? I'll close this dialog box. When I look at the local server in the server manager dashboard, what I will see, look at the computer name there. Does everybody see this? Yeah. Okay. So once the virtual system is loaded with the Windows software, it's, it's going to assign a random name. And if I'm going to set up a service like PNS, that, that other systems are going to depend on. I want the IP address to be something that will remain constant, that isn't randomly assigned. And I want the name to be settled. So I'm going to go ahead with this and I'm going to change the name. But when I'm in here, I'm also going to change the time zone. When I do that, it's going to ask me to reboot the system. And at that point, I'm going to go ahead and let it reboot. What we're going to do, though, to configure this is we'll click through about six or seven screens. And you saw just a moment ago, it said add a role. We're going to add the DNS role. So you'll notice the time zone is different. It's not, it keeps clearing that one screen on us. The time zone is different than our actual time. So I need to get back into here to change the time. 
So if I open up server manager and I have a, a correct uh, activation key, I'm gonna say, don't show this again. It may take a reboot or two for this thing to behave properly. And I'm going into the control panel and I'm gonna change it from within the control panel. I keep losing the server manager option. There's control panel. My date time. I'm going to change my time zone from Pacific to Georgetown, La Paz, Manaus, San Juan. Now my time is good. I'm going to change my system name. It's going to open up this screen. It says Windows 2022 Data Center. So it looks like we're good on the license and the version of the software. I may have to run updates if it's going to behave completely uh, with complete sanity. But what I want to do is go to the advanced system settings. It'll pop up a dialog box that will allow me to change the computer name from this gobbledygook right here. What's, what's the, um, where, did, where did the Smurfs live? What was the name of the town where the Smurfs lived? Does anybody know? Was it Whoville or no, that's, um, oh gosh, that's Dr. Seuss. We're almost done and we should, should be able to give you an IP address. Uh, I can conclude the recording after the IP address is, is uh, manually assigned. Um, here's our Google. Where, oh, where do Smurfs live? Smurf Village, okay, Smurf Village. So I'm gonna go ahead and use that in my configuration of this, uh, this uh, system, right? So the work group I'm gonna say is Smurf Village. Now, as soon as I do this, it's gonna to wanna, to It'll say, okay, and, and then it'll ask me to reboot the system. So we'll pause the recording again. And then uh, as soon as it comes up, we'll be able to add DNS, we'll have an IP address and you'll be able to try it. So at this point, we're looking at like five or 10 more minutes. I, I'd like to finish the recording. If, if you have uh, elsewhere you need to be, um, but if you can stick around for just a few more minutes, you'll be able to use it and try it. You can actually copy a screenshot of that. So we want this thing to have a real IP address. I'm gonna go ahead and, and check the IP address that it has right now. I just wanna make sure it has a public address and that it's pulling that properly from the UVI campus. So if I just type in IP config, it, it says 50. Oh, that's that's wonderful. Can everybody see where it says 50? Yeah. Okay, so that's the one we're gonna use. As soon as we finish rebooting and we start DNS, we'll add the, the root hints 
to the DNS service, restart the service, and then you'll be able to connect to 50 and use it. I think at this point, we might be as, as uh, quick as five minutes out, all right? So I'm gonna go ahead and restart because I don't, I don't want name changes to be in play. So I'm gonna say this is a planned restart. Should restart pretty quickly. And now it's not gonna be in the default work group called work group, which is very important. When people are using File Explorer and they're connected to a network, they can use File Explorer to browse the network. And if, they're, if you're a member of the same work group called work group, which is the default name, then you see other machines that are on that network in the same work group. It's a serious exposure. So let's see if we can pause. So we do have a momentary uh, hiccup, the reboot after the system name change and work group change. Uh, the screen has gone black. It seems to be unresponsive. We're going to go ahead and attempt uh, a hard-coded hard-coded reboot. So we're going to close. This time we're going to power off the machine. Now I'll go back to my virtual box. Let's power it on and see if we get a different, different outcome. So that's normal. During the install and configuration process, when you're provisioning new resources or setting up a system, you can have a case where it just doesn't, it's a little stuck. There are new algorithms in the operating system, uh, you know, self-corrective types of things. So uh, it's a lot, lot more robust than it used to be. We, we should have a login prompt pretty soon. At that point, the machine should be a member of a distinctly different work group with a proper name. And at that point, we can add DNS and we're done. And we can start using this. So now we can uh, log in on our new system. And uh, the first thing we're gonna wanna check is to make sure that the, the name change persisted and the time change persisted because of the hiccup that we had. The odds are pretty good that it posted, but it just was updating other things in the meantime. So we should have a screen shortly where we can add the DNS role, add cached root hints only, and then start using our new DNS machine. So the server Dashboard should come up in just a moment. Server manager dashboard. And uh, that'll give us a chance to look at the, the options here. I'm gonna see if I can change the display just so there's a little more real estate. Be nice to have a little more real estate. You don't have to have that. Uh, it's grayed out, so we can't change it from anything there. Uh, one thing that we can do is to insert the guest edition's CD image, load drivers through that uh, virtual box CD, and that would probably give us the chance to change our uh, 
uh, resolution, the size of our screen. So it looks like we're having issues with our server manager. Um, let's look at our system properties to see if our license is working. So we do have a name and uh, at this point, if we have the correct work group, we can change the, there it is, Smurf Village. So that worked. Um, I don't see any warning signs. I click about about the product key. Let's look in here and see if the activation key is good. Windows is activated, so the key worked. So it's not an activation issue. Uh, what we're going to do at this point, the time is correct. So all of those changes, it may just need to, to load updates. I'm gonna go ahead and attempt to start the server manager and add the DNS role. So as soon as this screen comes up, I'm gonna click on roles. I'm gonna add the role and feature. It's collecting information so the wizard can uh, build the options for us. And then after this, we'll be able to connect to our machine. Another thing we can try is to see whether or not uh, we have the same IP address that we had before. If we're having problems with our server, again, you want to go to the devices option, insert the guest edition CD, load that, reboot it, and then that often solves the problem when you have issues like this. So this is uh, one thing we can recommend as a part of the build. Looks like we have an unresponsive system again. So that would be our next recommended step. Uh, we will have to reboot the system at this point. I'm going to see this through and finish configuring the DNS and then edit the video. I'll send email to you so that you know what IP address to use for the DNS service. Right? Yeah. And then um, that way I don't hold you up the rest of the afternoon while we're getting the kinks out, okay? Okay. All right, we'll stop sharing and recording and we'll see you in class on Monday. Keep your eyes peeled for that email.